Okay, hey everybody, and welcome to Indie Film Cafe Spotlight. And tonight we have a special guest. We have Steve Rudzinski. Say hello, to everybody, Steve. Hey, everyone, it's me, Steve. Yay, outstanding, sir. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Now, those of you who've been paying attention and watching Indie Film Cafe know that we have already covered Karis Hell on our What the Fuck Friday episodes. Uh, and it was a fabulous film, lots of fun. Uh, I, I can't say enough good things about that particular film. Um, I believe that and Velocipaster were my two favorite movies that came out that particular year, and I was just blown away by both. And Carousel in particular was just a lot of fun. So I'm very, very pleased and happy and thankful to have Mr. Steve Rudzinski here on our show. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing A-OK, -okay, just trying to survive, as we all are. I understand. It's it's a peculiar uh, set of circumstances these days with uh, COVID and everything. And for um, indie filmmakers, this is uh, just, I can't imagine what you guys have to jump through and have to deal with in times like this. I mean, it's a, it's a struggle. I'm not going to lie. You know, I, I still have my online stores, what have you. But, you know, most of my, most of my salary comes from convention appearances. There's no conventions. Right. Uh, but the second biggest part of my um, salary is acting. There's no acting gigs. Mm. But it is what it is. Right, right. Um, and you are an actor, a writer, a director. God knows what else I imagine I'm missing. You pretty much do it all, don't you? Uh, more or less, which I feel is pretty, pretty consistent when it comes to the independent scene. You, you kind of have to be a jack of all trades because you never know what's going to be paying. Right, so you got to wear a lot of hats. Exactly. Outstanding. All right, so I guess before we get into the Karis Hell films, <clears throat> I was kind of hoping we, we might get a little bit of background about you and about uh, your early days, and how did you start getting involved in independent film? Um, well, the early days is, it goes all the way back to when I was like 12 and I saw Army of Darkness, and that's ah. what made me immediately decide that I wanted to be a director when I grew up. There you go. Um, that that desire never changed. So, you know, throughout high school, I made terrible backyard movies with some terrible, like, <laughs> high 8 camera. And then I got the big upgrade to the mini DV camera when I was, like, 17 or something like that. Uh, tried making some complete garbage movies with friends and, like, just whoever was available and free for a while. Sure. And I did that for a little bit. I tried to make a feature... Uh, which turned out really bad, called Basic Slaughter. I made that in 2007, I want to say, and it wasn't good. It was very, very poor in every aspect, and no one to blame for it except me. It was all my fault. So I took, I took a bit of a break from features. I did an online series called VG Spoofs for two seasons. Didn't get much um, reaction, but I was able to learn a lot by doing that, something more episodic and smaller uh, day by day. So, and it ended up being like two hours worth of episodes. So I still made basically another feature, even though it wasn't a feature. Okay, cool. After that is when I decided like, no, I, I want to get back into movies. I, I don't want to do just like internet, YouTube stuff. You know, I want to do movies. So in 2010, I wrote and we shot uh, The Slasher Hunter, a 30 minute short, which then came out in 2011. A lot of folks like that. So I just used that momentum to then go into Everyone Must Die my next feature film in 2012. Okay. And that one, that one never made too much money, but it got <clears throat> enough buzz that it made me seem more legitimate, I guess. Because the only reason why I got the directing job on Captain Z is because the producer slash star of Captain Z enjoyed Everyone Must Die and saw what I did with so little. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's uh, great. Also did, you know, Super Task Force around that time just for myself. And that ended up being one of, the most popular movies I ever made, although it took a while. At this point, I'm probably not going to do a sequel because it took that long, but mm. I'm glad it, have, it got there at least a little bit. Uh, Captain Z, like I said, that one came out. That was like a full budget, full crew, locations, the whole shebang. That was probably my, mo my first professional, real professional set. And then I just kind of wanted to take it easy again, you know, worked on a big one. So then I did Red Christmas for just a small amount of money. That was like almost no crew, a cast of three. 
Wow. All shot in like one room. We shot the entire film in two days. Hmm. And for some reason, people really enjoy that one. I'm not a fan of it because it's a genre I don't like. But I wanted to test myself in a genre I didn't like. That's a great idea. So you never know. You know, you never know sure. what people like. I, I've had uh, a couple strangers coming up to me and be like, oh, Red Christmas, that's my favorite movie you did. And in my head, I'm like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> but no, no, like, my mouth just says, oh, thank you so much. I put a lot of heart into that. That's great. I mean, it's good that you don't pigeonhole yourself in one particular genre that, um, you know, you can do different things because you never know. You might have somebody who sees your stuff and say, hey, you know, I know you don't do this kind of film, but I really like your style and I'd like to see if you'd want to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. I, th I think part of my, at least on an unconscious level, my plan was like, okay, well, I mean, horror is the easy one to make money, but let's try a few other genres just to see if I can expand my fan base a little bit. And right. I definitely have a few fans that found me out because of Super Task Force, which is a Tokuzatsu film. And because they like that, they ended up buying my other stuff and my horror stuff. So it's worked at least to a small degree. I don't know yeah. how much it has worked, but to a small degree it has. That's great. That's great. It's, it's um, good to be, you know, it's good to have a lot of different um, tools in your toolkit. Yes, absolutely. I definitely agree on that. That way it, it helps you think on your feet. Uh, then in 2016, we, you know, we got, we did Care as Hell. Oh, I, also did, I also did The Survivors in 2014. I forgot, 2015. I forgot about that. Um, but yeah, we got Care as Hell. A lot of work, a lot of effort, had a great producer, had a great crew, had a great cast, and made what I consider to be a really great indie horror slasher comedy. I completely agree. A lot of people liked it. Uh, it got picked up by Wild Eye Releasing, like by Mark, like it was... The first screening was October of 2016, and Wild Eye picked it up in, like, February of 2017. Nice. Uh, but they weren't releasing it for a while. Hmm. And them having the movie and not releasing it for a while means we weren't possibly making any money off of it for a while. Yeah, what was the deal with that? Did they, did they explain? Uh, nope, but I'm not alone on that. I hear from a lot of other folks about how they've just sat and waited for years to get released from a, any distributor, but also including Wild Eye. I, it, it's the nature of the business, whatever. Yeah. But That's... since I had nothing to do for a couple of years, I watched a lot of movies. I focused on the review podcast more, Movie Films with Bill and Steve, which is now ended. All the episodes are still up, though. Mm. But at one point, we were watching Talking Animal Holiday movies, and I was, I was just getting so furious at how bad they were, but how much money they had to make them. Like, they have all these huge budgets and all these amazing resources and all these great cast members, and they just were releasing these horrible, cookie-cutter, uninteresting films, with a few exceptions. Shout out to The Three Dogateers, which was <laughs> very self-aware and actually made yeah, us laugh a lot. That's adorable, but I was hoping we were getting to my next section of films, because, you know, I love the Meowy films. Yes. Yes, good. So, so the first one, A Meowy Christmas was just made out of spite. <laughs> That's other great. Animal movies. It was just like, these, these pieces of garbage are like just squandering a million dollars on every movie that they Seriously. make. Seriously. And like, like, The Dog Who Saves Christmas was one in particular that we just ragged on. And it's literally just a worse version of Home Alone, except with a dog. Right. So I was like, you know what? I have $500 and a cat. I'm going to make a worse version of Home Alone with an animal, except I'm going to spend $500. Good for you. Um, and you know what? It, it's still me, and I'm still weird. And Bill Murphy was also weird. So the movie still ended up being way weirder and more creative than Save the Dog Who Saves Christmas, even though it, it was still a send-up of Home Alone. For some reason, kids loved it. For some reason, it made money. Not just kids. I mean, I've been showing that one to a number of people, and everybody I've shown it to has just thought it was absolutely delightful. It's, it is. It's a lot of fun. That's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. But So we had success with that one. Still had not much to do, so then I did the sequel, A Meowie Halloween, Yay. which is the best financial decision I've ever made in my life. <laughs> For uh, I think I spent maybe $400 on that film. It has made a percentage wise, it's my most profitable film. Like, obviously, we've sold more units of Carousel, but in terms of like budget to profit, that Talking Cat Halloween movie is where it's at, baby. Let me tell awesome. You. Awesome. Um, That's um, those you can see on Amazon? Uh, they are on Prime. 
a, a, a lot of my movies are on Prime Video. Uh, some of my movies are on Tubi. Uh, some of my movies are like on some other smaller streaming stuff. My films are also available physically at SilverSpotlightFilms.com. And, of course, I have my own streaming network, SteveBuster.com, where it's two ninety nine a month, and everything is unlisted YouTube links, so you can actually keep all of the movies even after like you unsubscribe. Outstanding. So when we put this up, we'll be sure to include that link down below. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. And I have to say, in addition to Care's Hell, we also covered Meowie Christmas on Indie Film Cafe because it was so much fun. And um, my roommate at the time, Lenore, absolutely adored that film. That's wonderful. Have you gotten a chance to see Halloween yet? Yes, and I okay, loved it. Good. We haven't we haven't covered it yet, and I, okay. I wanted I want to do that. I just haven't done it yet. That is perfectly okay. I just wanted to make sure you saw it, especially as a horror fan and as some of the like the first movie. Like Halloween is Halloween is a love letter to horror fans without the kids <laughs> knowing that. Right, right. For it those is awesome. Of, for those of you listening at home, that movie has like forty five horror movie references in it, including <laughs> at one point a character opens up a puzzle box and sees a bright light. And then you hear chains, and then that character canonically disappears because awesome. they went to hell. Right, right. In this children's film, the Cenobites are torturing this poor innocent man. As you do. But kids don't know that. Right, 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 right. No, no, it was great. It was a lot of fun. So, you know, definitely it's on my list. I, you know, I have so many movies that we're trying to cover. It's just, it's an impossible task, but we are definitely uh, putting in as much Steve Rosinski films as we can. Hey, I understand. Like I made a lot. I don't blame you. Okay. So that's awesome. Um, and so then the next one that you ended up uh, doing, I, I guess, uh, if you were still in the Meowie things, um, can we talk a little bit more about uh, Carousel and how did that one get together? How did that, how did that uh, project gel and where did you get the great, great cast? They were really, really fantastic. I, you know, when I explain to folks that this is an independent film, they look at me like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> These guys were great. Well, that's amazing. That's really nice to hear. Uh, yeah, you, very often you, you see the opposite in a lot of written reviews. Right, <laughs> right. Where it's just like, yeah, you can tell they had literally no money to make this. It's like, I, I mean, we, we were a small budget, but we had money. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, it just, it just goes to show you that, you know, it doesn't really matter so much about the money as long as you have people who believe in the project and who are talented and who will give everything that they can 100% to it, you can carry a film. And, you know, I, I look at a movie like that and I think, man, this is the kind of film that no Hollywood director, no Hollywood studio would have touched. And yet it was my, just about one of my favorite films of the entire year and so much more entertaining and so much better than anything that Hollywood would have shot out. And, Everything that that movie did was just on point. It was really, really good. Thank you so much. That really means a lot to us. Um, we we really feel like we did something with Carousel that needed to be done. Just there, there's not enough weird comedy horrors these days. Not Very enough true. object killers these days. And Duke's story needs to be told. It does need to be told. It's a very important story. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, with how it came together, it's just like um, my co-writer on the film, Aline Isley, she came to me one day and she just said, you know, we should make a movie. And 99% of the time, whenever someone says those words to me, my eyes roll so far into the back of my head that I'm blinded. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm sure this will be a great idea. No offense to everyone that's done that to me at conventions. I love you. Oh, um, sure. Nobody really <laughs> understands other than yourself and other people who make films just exactly what that entails. Um, but, but she came to me and said, we should make a movie about a killer carousel unicorn. We call it Carous Hell. Awesome. And I stopped and went, that's a great idea. That's a great title. Yes. Let's talk about this. So I kind of went back and forth with her and said, like, okay, so why is he killing people? What's the motivation? And she thought for a moment, she thought about it, and then she used to work at uh, amusement parks. For sake of identity, I won't say specifically which one, but she worked at amusement parks. Okay. And the biggest takeaway she had, one of the biggest takeaways, was just how how many people treat the rides like garbage. Right. That are just like abusive and like hidden and like just just scum people to these rides. 
And she said, okay, so uh, some, some fat kid climbs on top of the unicorn and just beats the crap out of the unicorn and wipes boogers on the unicorn, and that's what makes the unicorn really mad when we kill a kid. And I'm like, you are singing everything I want to hear right now. Let's keep going. So we worked out the plot. We figured out the motivations. Um, very early on, I think I was the one that made the decision. I'm just like, well, Duke is going to talk. I, I want to do a talking killer slasher because I haven't done that yet. So prior to Carousel, I'd never done a, a horror movie with a talking killer. Right. Well, I, I guess I did. Uh, in the parody of the Slasher Hunter, there was talking killers, but I don't. The parody's different. I digress. Um, and it was also her idea to be like, okay, I, the horse doesn't move. I want it to be static. I want I want you to think of like the scene from Mary Poppins when the horses are just floating. That's nice. how Duke. That's how Duke moves. And that basically, like, very, very much isolated the tone of the film. <laughs> so we worked from there, came up with a great script. You know, I called back Scott Lewis, who I'd worked with on uh, Everyone Must Die, on Captain Z, because I we work very well together. Uh, we, we flow well, we gel well. Uh, Cody Rook, who did the effects on Carousel, phenomenally. I actually first met in 2014 when we were originally trying to make Carousel, and it just didn't work out. Uh, so since Carousel didn't work out at that time, I was like, hey, Cody, I got a few hundred bucks. I'm doing the Red Christmas movie. Will you just come and do the effects for that? And he said, hell yeah, I want to work with you and see what it's like and stuff. Mm -hmm. Had a great time on Red Christmas. He loved it. I went back to him to do the Wolfster makeup for the survivors. And then when we finally got the money for Carousel, Cody was all in, baby. You know, I gave him his budget and he just delivered. There's no, no issues, no back and forth. It was just like, hey, can you do this? Yeah. That's or, awesome. Or, you know, one kill would be more simple in the script. He would say, hey, can I make that guy's head like a piss dispenser? And I was like, is it in budget? Yeah. Then yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's great. There was a lot of really good effects, too. I, I was just amazed at some of them. Um, yeah, it, it was great. But, you know, really, really, it's just the, the, the actors were just fantastic. Yourself included. I, I think... Um, your character and then uh, Haley Madison are my two favorite characters in the entire film. You guys did such a great job. Uh, what well, can you uh, tell me about say, their uh, characters? Well, first, let me say thank you for saying that. It's very kind. I hear that a lot. So I guess they were right. Oh, yeah. And the day I will now say that I did not want to be Joe the pizza guy. I did not want to act in the damn movie at all. I just wanted to direct. I... I don't really like it when directors make themselves the funniest, like, main character in a movie. But I wrote the script, and then Alina was just like, you got to be Joe the Pizza Guy. This is you. I'm like, I'm not going to be Joe the Pizza Guy. <laughs> and Scott Lewis read the script and said, Steve, you got to be Joe the Pizza Guy. This is you. I'm like, I don't want to be in the movie. <laughs> and then the producer who was giving us all of the money read the script and said, Steve, you have to be Joe the Pizza Guy. I was like, it was damn fake. it. <laughs> I'm not she knocked it out of the park, man. Thank you, thank you. Um, for everyone else, um, it was just, I mean, it was just standard casting. You know, I threw out a bunch of casting calls, a bunch of people auditioned, a bunch of people applied, and we just kind of chose the best, what we thought was the best of the best. Haley really nailed being as adorable as that character should be, and she had, oh, yeah. the, com and she had the comedy chops beyond, like, necessity she was hilarious she hit every single bit of timing exactly how we wanted her to hit it how we needed her to hit it and she's wow. a lot of people's favorites and she was fearless during the sex scene i was gonna say that that must not have been easy it was we well whenever <laughs> i do nudity i do try to make everything as comfortable as possible so it's always like i'm sure you've heard it plenty of times but it's like very minimal crew very minimal anything do it at the end of the day take as long as we need to with it that sort of thing so when it came to that sex scene we had josh miller who Haley is friends with in real life and played pierre he was audio for that since they okay. knew each other scott was there for camera aline was there for like lights and to help with puppeteering Haley was there and i was there and that was it it was just us in that room and um, I mean, I'd say most of it was pretty hilarious and fun uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to like awkward or anything like that. Uh, Cause Haley was again, all in hilarious, fantastic, signed on completely for this weird ass sex scene. 
I'd say the only hard part is when you have the whole Duke in the shot because you don't see me kneeling down, holding all of Duke on like just my shoulder, moving back and forth to try to emulate sex. <laughs> wow. Other than that, it was just like, hey, um, what would be funny? Hey, Haley, can you do cowgirl? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Cut. That was hilarious. I'm in wow. tears. All right, moving on. Well, I mean, like I said, the whole movie was just so well acted by everybody, but you and and Haley really, really stood out uh, as as the best flowers in the garden, so to speak. And I, I just wanted to point that out. And everyone that I've I've shown this to, and I've been showing it to everyone, um, they pretty much agree. So you guys did a great job. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You bet. So this is a good segue then, because we know, spoiler alert, that uh, our frisky little friend Duke manages to uh, escape at the end of Karis Hell the first. Yes. And so now that segues us into Karis Hell 2. So what can you tell us about this? Well, uh, Karis Hell the second, and to me that title is very important because it, go, it really ties into what the plot of the film is. And it's, so Duke had a very romantic evening with Haley J. Madison's character, oh, yeah. Sarah. Uh, very romantic. And if you watch the next scene, after the first bit of credits, you do see that uh, Lori's mother, played by Judy Kirby, um, actually, I'm not sure, her last name isn't Kirby anymore because she just got married. I'm sorry, Judy. I'm a piece of trash for not... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> being more prepared for this. Um, but Judy finds uh, a little baby because right. of because of magic. Uh, Duke's magical seed created <laughs> a baby very quickly. It was born from Sarah. And the movie ends with that baby launching itself towards Lori's mother. Canonically, he leapt into her arms and it was very sweet. Oh. It's a good baby. It's a very good baby. It's just scared and is scared to be alone. And you find out that Lori's mother has raised Duke's son mm -hmm. as her own. Very cool. And some and years later, she reaches out to Duke because he has his own chirper handle now. <laughs> of course he does. Uh, just chirping. He's a huge hit to let him know that he has a son. And Duke isn't sure how to handle that, but it feels right for him to go back and see what he can do about what is essentially is his responsibility. Right, right, right. So a, a big significant portion of Carousel the Second is about Duke trying to be a father, as insane as that sounds for a sequel to Carousel One, the over-the-top slasher comedy. But that... Mm -hmm. It's really the story that Aline and I felt was like the most right to tell next. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that totally makes sense because, I mean, if, if you approach it like, oh, let's just make another sequel and we can have the same kind of thing, you know, funny wooden horse kills everybody, blah, blah, blah. It's just not going to be very good. It's, it's not really continuing the story. But yeah. now you've got something deeper going on with this particular carousel magical creature in that, you know, he's got this, this son and it's a universal thing. I mean, people have kids, they have fathers, they have relationships. This is something that's going to hook people. It doesn't kind of really matter if it's a unicorn horse or not. Everybody can relate to this kind of a story. I, I think so, too. And, like, I, as a fan, I'm a big fan of sequels that just go nuts and just do something different. Sure. Uh, I like Gremlins 2 way more than Gremlins 1. I, I'm one of those people that actually really like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 because it feels nothing like Nightmare on Elm Street 1. So I wanted to do something like that because I, like you basically just said, I didn't want to just throw Duke in a house with another group of kids and he kills them again. I didn't want someone to be like, they spit on Duke by accident and he gets mad and hunts them down. That would have been so easy to do. We could have right. filmed that the next week after we filmed the first one. But I don't want to do that with Duke with with Karis Hell. If we're doing the sequel, I want to do something that is actually the story of Duke moving forward. Because Duke is the protagonist of the series. Right. I, that was our, Aline and I, that was our attitude when writing the first film. Duke's the hero. He's killing everyone, but he's the hero. <laughs> um, however, I do know that there. this is the entertainment business and not just me doing stuff for myself. 
So it is important to give to the fans what they want and what they sure. expect. So don't get me wrong. Although the big focus of the film is on Duke and his son, there is still a lot of killing, a lot of blood, more sex. And the other plot of the film is that we start to learn about Duke's origins in this movie. Ah, and, very cool. And we meet Duke's creators. Now, a few people have mentioned it on podcast reviews and type reviews or just asking me. Cowboy Cool calls Duke a Nazi like twice. Right. And we don't call any other attention to that in the first film. But it was always our intention to jump into that in the sequel and find out that Duke was created by the Nazis. <laughs> they, in a very Puppet Master-esque homage that they're trying to create these immortal soldiers to fight against the Allies. And Duke nice. is one of them. He's but like it, an, doesn't, it doesn't go according to plan. He's not, he is not a Nazi. He's like an uber stallion. Exactly. <laughs> That's great. Oh, so, right. that, so that'll be the, an, the antagonists of the film. I don't want to get too, too deep into that, you know, without major spoilers, but Duke will be fighting Nazis. I'll say that much. For sure. Yay, as you should. Absolutely. And I, I have to say, um, I'm very pleased as punch that this is coming out because I don't know if you recall, but we had a Facebook conversation at one point where I was asking, what are the odds that we're going to see a sequel to Karis Hell? And you were like, you seemed very down about the idea. You're like, well, you know, it's hard to recoup your money and it's, you spend you know, a lot of money and you don't get anything in return. And these days it's extremely tough. And sure, you had brought up a lot of very good points. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know, especially with COVID stuff going on, what are the odds that we're going to get to see something like this again? But lo and behold, uh, Rebecca Reinhardt is a, a, a friend in common. Came out to me, or she, she, we two were talking, and she's like, "Oh yeah, it's going to be a carousel too." I was like, "What? What? 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 <laughs> How fabulous is that?" So, what, what kind of changed your mind? Well, I mean, I'm, I've always been a straight shooter with this sort of thing, you know. Like one of my panels is advice from an independent filmmaker. Don't. Uh, hmm. So I'm always very real with this sort of thing. The simple fact is that Carousel 1 has, is very loved. It has a lot of fans. A lot of people appreciate it. A lot of people have bought it. Financially, we're still very much in the red. Mm. If this was just a, a, like our producer or us making the sequel, it would still not be happening simply because of that. You can't, you know, if you're not making the money off of what you did prior, you can't justify trying to do it again. So sure. that's kind of why we're going to the fans with this for better or for worse you know uh, i know some folks are a fan of crowdfunding or they look down on it and i understand that but that's really the only way this movie will and can exist is if the fans really come together and really put in the effort to help us create the film because so many people have said when are you making carousel 2 and i'm like as soon as it makes money that may not happen for a long while but people really want carousel 2 so that's why i'm like okay help please Right, like, right, right, right. No, I, I want, totally agree. You guys want Carousel too? Here's how it happens. Mm -hmm. This is the only way it happens. So, like, we, I really went out of my way to work the budget and write the script in a way that we could slash the budget, like the budget of the film, of the sequel in like half without losing quality of like the performances or quality of the kills, just in the sense of like locations and number of characters and that sort of thing. I was able to get right. the budget much lower to what I believe is a very attainable goal of the ten thousand dollars to make part two no that's great that's a great budget so if if we can get that then great and you know i mean if we get it awesome we're gonna make carousel two we're gonna kick its ass we're gonna get it out there and hopefully the fans will love it just as much and at that point it's gonna be the same sort of situation maybe there'll be carousel three but I don't want to make any promises. <laughs> that would be fabulous. Well, I can tell you I've already pledged, and we'll make sure that we put all that information down below as well so that everybody can else who wants to pledge and who wants to see more carousel films, this is the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm Again, like, I really appreciate everyone's support that they've given me. I appreciate all the passion that everyone has expressed to me about the first film and now the sequel. One of the cool things about this crowdfunding campaign is that I've been seeing other people post the campaign to horror groups, and I've been seeing a bunch of comments from people being like, oh, I love the first one, and I have no idea who they are. I have no idea how they found the film, mm -hmm. when they saw the film, but they love the film, and they actually care about the sequel, and that's a really good feeling. 
that right. uh that like i aline the whole team we were able to like make a bunch of strangers around the world smile and laugh a little bit and we didn't even know it that's awesome and the thing is too is that you know the indie film community especially in the in the what you would consider micro budget it's a pretty small community i mean there's a lot of different people and different groups doing things but everybody kind of sort of knows each other and um as an outsider coming in because you know i have a completely different career and i just kind of fell into this whole thing with Indie Film Cafe and by association into Sick Flick Productions where we're doing our own stuff. But I've been able to network and meet a lot of different people and we have a lot of uh, friends in common and it's just been amazing how a project like this will go out and a lot of people will support it, they'll talk about it, they'll spread the word, they'll network with their friends, they'll pledge when they can. And it's just a great thing. And you look at what goes on in Hollywood and you think, my God, they, they don't do anything like this. You know, if anything, it's a lot of, it's a lot of backstabbing and, you know, uh, fights trying to secure money and things that only get greenlit in the first place, wh which are going to be, you know, uh, things that are just prolonging, um, you know, uh, intellectual property so they can, because the bottom line is all they care about. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I am always one of those people that are firm on saying that it is the entertainment business. Money is obviously a defining factor. I get into a lot of arguments on the micro budget and the indie scene. That being said, there is still a difference between, you know, our level and what Hollywood seems like they do. Or as you just said, it seems like Hollywood cares more about the bottom line than any of the art or even the entertainment to it. Sure. Uh, whereas, like, again, I will fight. You need to make money. <laughs> no matter how small you are, that's the point. But it seems like a lot of guys and gals on my level are able to marry the two a little bit better. And that's mm -hmm. not to say Hollywood never does that. There's plenty of Hollywood films I love, but I, I enjoy the passion of the indies a lot more. Absolutely, absolutely. And the fact is the indies will do stories and characters and and situations that hollywood just will not touch it's you know i mean that's the thing with hollywood unless it's like guaranteed they'll jump shark most of the time very rarely will over the top ideas get the approval in hollywood and even then sometimes they may get approval it might be some insane take on a comic book superhero property where a director has a really passionate vision about uh, an evil version of a character and time travel and a series of five films before you get to where the fans want the characters to be. And the studio pays for it twice and then says, oh, wait, people don't like this. Never mind. Canceled. Right, right. Or there's just stuff that nobody cares about. I mean, I, I was reading that we're going to get like, a, I don't know, $100 million biopic on Vanilla Ice. I mean, really? Do we need to see that? I'd, I'd much rather have 20 Karis Hell movies. Right, Come right. On. That's always the thing, too, you know, the, with the Hollywood budgets and what they spend on the films they make is sometimes mind-boggling. I'll see stuff where I see every single dollar of the budget on the screen and I get it, and then I'll see stuff where I'm just, dog just saves Christmas. Let's go back to that. I have no idea where they spent all their money, aside from the fact that they paid for, like, several name actors for no reason in a mansion. I otherwise have no idea why that movie costs more than, say, $20,000. And I know it costs way more than that. Yeah, I mean, I, the only thing I can think of is, you know, SAG. You're using SAG production, SAG people. I mean, I'm not, that, is, that is always a factor when you're working. Right, with right. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bagging on them. You're getting professionals. But a lot of your money ends up going to that, just for that alone. Yeah. And you know what? I, I get it. Uh, the unions are important, especially with how Hollywood operates, because Hollywood will absolutely take advantage of a lot of people. Absolutely. A lot of a lot of indie creators will absolutely take advantage of a lot of people, which is why, to me, communication is always the most important direct thing when it comes to what I do, which is why sometimes when people ask me, where's Carousel 2, uh, like Paul, I'll say, I don't know, I don't got any money. Um, but at the same time, yeah, obviously when you work with Teamsters, the budget immediately is going to instantaneously go up, like, say, $500,000. Right. And that, that doesn't have to be the only option. But to a lot of people, it feels like unless you're doing that, it's not a real movie. And I don't jive with that. Again, I'm, yeah. I'm pro-union, but I don't think union should be the only way. That's, that's right. 
And the other thing is that it seems, at least for me on the outside, that I don't want to say there's conspiracy, but it seems like like some of the outlets, Amazon and Netflix and some of the other big multi, you know, faceted uh, uh, conglomerates out there are not really allowing a lot of the indies to, to, to do their thing, you know, that they're just not interested in carrying them. I mean, they were maybe at first, but it, it seems like a lot of them are just not, are just not really trying anymore. I mean, I understand I have a number of friends who've had their, their properties on Amazon that were just dropped for no reason, you know, just because I guess, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's like they were good enough to get uh, put on prime in the beginning. And now all of a sudden they're gone and they were never told why. And it seems like it, it seems to be mainly independent filmmakers. And, you know, you just got, got to ask yourself what's going on with that. Yeah. They, it, people just, those companies just don't care about the Indies. And at the end of the day, it's their servers, it's their company. Yes, obviously they can do whatever they want. I'm not denying that. That comes up a lot. Like, yes, they have the right to just ax a movie without any explanation. But we still have every right to criticize that. And the idea that, like, they, they're they spending so little money on hosting movies compared to, like, all sure. the other money they make that it's confusing as to why they would do that for cost-cutting measures which to me makes it seem way more obvious they just don't want those sorts of pictures on their service because they don't want to be seen as the lesser streaming service or what have you. Oh, that's ridiculous. Especially, I mean, one of the best things about having all the indies out, uh, indie films and indie creations is there's just the great variety of stories that you can get from that. Whereas, again, Hollywood is just you know, cookie cuttering and stamping out the same stuff. Uh, just sequel after sequel, prequels, reboots. Who wants to see the same thing over and over and over? I mean, according to the money, a lot of people, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know yeah, how accurate but, that is. But you're right, because up until recently, I always sung the praises of Prime Video. You know, call me a you know a corporate sellout or whatever, but I loved Prime because they enabled filmmakers and creators to submit directly to get onto the service. Exactly. And, be and because of that, there was so much more diversity on Prime Video than there was on any other streaming service. I loved Prime Video. And don't get me wrong, I'll fully admit, I still have a Prime subscription because there is still a lot of diversity by comparison on Prime. But what they've been doing to the indies is garbage. How they've been just cutting how much they pay the indies so much is insane. Right. Um, a Meowie Halloween made like $700 uh, in the month it was released in 2018 on just prime streaming, like not including rentals, not including sales. It made like $800. Nice. Uh, Meowie St. Patrick's Day made $6. Oh. Cause that's how much they've cut. Now some independent film filmmakers have been able to make more because of the way the system, the algorithms and the systems work which is awesome, but overall, I keep on hearing from people that they went from, this is my career, to how can I sell my movie at all? There's no money now. Right, And, and, and again, the creators that just have their stuff taken down without recourse. Like, you can't resubmit it, you can't get a reason why, you can't ask why, it's just gone. And it's terrible, because you go from, okay, I, instead of focusing on a quality story that's really, really well done, that we have passion about, we have to look about how are we going to play the algorithms. Yeah. And that's, I mean, don't get me wrong. Even I played that. One of the reasons why Meowie Halloween did so well, do you know how many movies have the name Halloween in them on Prime? <laughs> a bunch. No. No? Like none. You really? type in Halloween, a Meowie Halloween is like the second result because there was like six. Wow, like that's six great. six movies with the name Halloween in it, included <laughs> with Prime. That's the caveat. Like, obviously, every single Halloween is on there and stuff like that. But when it comes to movies included with Prime, you know, you got a, you got a parent in the middle of October just typing in the, name, the word Halloween included with Prime. They see a cat. Boom, they're watching it. Of oh, course, plus, that's a marketing decision. Plus, for kids, I mean, there's got to be very little for kids. Very little. That's, I think that's another reason why that's probably the most successful of the Meowies and will stay that way probably. As much as I love what I did with three and four and the insanity I get into in four, I still think Meowie 2 is the, the all-time classic Toxic so, Cat movie of mine. I, I have to ask, because I, it, you know, this is the sort of thing that goes to my head, but what are the chances we're going to see a Meowie-Duke mashup? 
uh, z- z- pretty much zero. <laughs> um, I, but it's it's because I've and this is something I've talked about a lot over the years. I I hate it when genres for an age group get aged up. I don't like that. Mm. You, know, you like for example, you have a lot of people saying like, "Oh man, I'd love an R-rated Power Rangers." And my response to that as a Power Rangers fan is, no, that sounds horrible because Power Rangers isn't meant to be R-rated. It's not meant to be in that territory of adulthood. If you want an R-rated Power Rangers, watch Guyver. Watch Garo. Those are, those are adult tokusatsus with lots of swearing and blood and violence. If you want that genre but R-rated, those already exist. Don't mm-hmm. change what this other thing is just because you're nostalgic for the title but don't want to look like a loser for like watching the kids show. So to me, I would never want the meowies to be R rated in my opinion. Now that makes, that makes a lot of sense. You want to be able to keep your, your meowies separate from your Dukes. But you know, for me, I would love to see, even if it wasn't so much a mashup, just maybe a quick little scene, you know, maybe meowies investigating something and you see a carousel horse walk by in the background. Well, you know, something fun like that. Well, Wally may come back. Wally okay. Griswold from the films, because you know, all my except for Super Task Force, all my movies take place on the same Earth, so all the characters could potentially meet. And one of my intentions with Meowie Four is to kind of end it with the Meowies, but not necessarily end it with Wally and Rick, his partner. So it, it's possible we could see them show up in a carousel, or Duke could show up in a Wally movie. Okay. But I, I don't want to. Whiskers will not run into Duke. I'll say that. To me, <laughs> I, I at least want to keep the cat and the the kids loving the cat separate from the extremely violent swearing unicorn. <laughs> that's that's my line. Is that okay? Is that fair? <laughs> that's fair. No, I totally get it. I totally get it. Um, so, what else do you have percolating in the background creatively? What what other kind of projects do you think you? Uh, want to start looking at i mean i'm very i've always been a very much one project at a time kind of guy whenever okay. i re- <coughs> excuse me whenever i release something people will always say oh what's next and i'm like still selling this one get back to me in a year um so right now my creative brain is all focused on carousel too that's Makes what sense. i'm worried about that's what we just wrote that's what i need to focus on if we're able to get the budget and I got to work on the schedule. I got to work on the, you know, the casting. There's still a few auditions I need to do for a few characters. I need to work out with Cody when he's available because Cody's coming back. I need his effects back. I can't make a movie without his effects. Right. And like, sure, we're tossing around a few story ideas for Carousel Three, but we need to worry about Carousel Two first. Okay, fair and, enough. And when it comes to Carousel Two after that, like, sure, there's some ideas. I've been talking about an idea of a uh, horror musical. Nice. Um, where it gets very violent in the third act and stops being a musical. <laughs> but at the same time, how marketable is that? That's the unfortunate thing. That's where I still am also a businessman. I don't know how well that would be received by people. So I don't know how much I want to go out of my way to make that film. Right. No, that makes sense. But if Carousel 2 happens, Carousel 2 is a success then the future's kind of wide open. I could do both Carousel 3 and that musical film if financially there's enough justification to, like, roll the dice on it. Oh, that'd be great. Like, like if I'm able to, like, oh, Carousel 2 made money, I can make Carousel 3 and make money, and then I can gamble on this other idea. And if I lose money, it's okay, because I got these other two that Mm -hmm. did okay. But, again, it comes down to if Carousel 2 even happens. Because if it doesn't, I don't know. If we don't get the budget for Carousel 2, I don't know what my future is as a filmmaker with the state of streaming and what have you. you know, I'm glad get it out there, folks. So please start bankrolling Carousel 2. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be guilt. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm throwing it out there because I want to see Carousel 2 and I want to see you making more stuff. I appreciate that. I really do. And I'm glad people dig what I do. Yeah. It's, a very, it's a very specific flavor of tea. Uh, but it is definitely a flavor of tea that I feel a lot of people want in their refrigerator. It's right up my dark, scary alley. Let's put it that way. Great. (laughs) 
All right, Steve. Well, thank you very, very much for coming on to the show. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we go? Any shout outs you want to give? Anything like that? Um, you know, just, you know what? Let me shout out Rob Steinbach was the producer of Carousel One. That movie would not exist if Rob Steinbach did not fund that film. He believed in the project. He really wanted it to happen. So if you guys love Carousel, give a Pour one out for Rod Steinbach. There you go. That uh, big shout out to Aline Isley for really coming up with the idea. Like she'll she'll tell you firsthand that I probably wrote seventy percent of the script, but the movie wouldn't exist if she didn't have the idea either. That's great. And, and I'm riding on that wave. I feel higher than her, and I don't think that's fair. But Aline is the one that came up with the idea. She came up with a lot of the jokes, a lot of the stuff in that script, and ditto for the sequel. She came up with a lot of the ideas of what we were going to do with the sequel. And I could not be doing these carousels without Elaine Isley. And finally, Wait. Scott Lewis, my cinematographer, my editor. He's the boy. Steve O'Bortz, composer of a lot of my films, just had a child. Congratulations, Steve. Fabulous. He is on a temporary retirement. We actually do not know if we will be able to get him back for Carousel 2 as the composer. But if not, it's okay. We understand. His family matters more. And that's it. So I would just say, you know, if you, if you like this interview, if you like my films, if you've seen just one of my things on Tubi or Prime Video and you want to see more, head over to silverspotlightfilms.com. That's where you can find, like, all of my movies, all the trailers, all the links, the store pages there. If you want to see my movies but can't afford to buy all of them, which I get because I've made, like, 11, <laughs> so, like, no, no judgment on that. Uh, stevebuster.com like I said it's a streaming service I kind of started up for folks that are just getting into my stuff that are interested $2.99 a month you can save stuff after you unsubscribe and we are still updating it twice a month with new stuff all the time that's great and, and, that's that's very reasonable and if we get Carousel 2 up and running Steve Buster is going to be where like the video diaries are that's going to be where <laughs> all the behind the scenes stuff is at, for the Steve Buster subscribers so if you just want to roll the dice, you know, three bucks, six bucks for two months, you know, it's like, give it a shot. Sure, absolutely. And I can tell you the content is definitely worth it. Thank you very much. I think we're at like 20 hours worth of stuff on there. Nice. Between all the movies and all the bonus features I've uploaded. I, I forget exactly, but I just remember it was like, oh, wow, I got that much stuff on there. What have I been doing with my life? Yeah, any idea about maybe adding a few more things, like maybe doing, a, you know, like a, an hour a week, kind of like a like a mini podcast talking about the film and what's going on, and you know, for sort of uh, you know background information for those of us who who are interested in the production. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if we end up making Carousel too, and the subscribers would want that sort of thing, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great. An episode about the writing process. I'd have a lean on that with me. We could do episodes like when we're talking about the effects. I'll do whatever. You guys give me money. I'll do it. I'm a whore. <laughs> there you go. That's the perfect attitude to have. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Um, all right. Well, great. Thank you very, very much, Steve, for coming on to the show. We greatly appreciate it. We love all your stuff at Indie Film Cafe, and we wish you nothing but good luck in the future. Thank you so much, Paul. It was a pleasure to be here, and thanks for listening, folks. Yep, absolutely. Thank you all very much. Thanks for tuning in to Indie Film Cafe Spotlight, and we will see you next time on the flip side. Bye, everyone.